Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm Gretchen Walters from the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. Um, I'm part of the Nature-Based Solutions Group um, uh, within the IUCN Secretariat. We're a large organization that uh, you um, probably know from different uh, angles and I'm in the secretary but we also work a lot with our commissions which are often academics and experts and on nature-based solutions we've been working with the commission on ecosystem management um, and so we've been developing um, some of the work that I'm going to be describing to you on our institutional approach uh, that will help also our our members which are both government and um, NGO members so I'm presenting you with some background and some case studies um, Hilda already went over the definition, so I won't I won't go over that again. Um, but just stressing that that uh, there is a complementarity to con to traditional conservation practice and what nature-based solutions are trying to achieve. And we are, but the lens is firm, foremost on addressing societal challenges such as climate change, food security, or natural disasters. We've been working. Um, uh, um, on uh, principles. The eight that you see on the screen are uh, what came out of our World Conservation Congress where our members voted um, to that, that we continue working on nature-based solutions. It forms a third of our, of our work as an institution um, from a variety of standpoints. So these, these principles, um, some of which uh, Hilda did refer to, I won't go through the whole list, um, but I do want to draw your attention to to um, principles six and eight and that which I think we'll be stressing a bit more with the case studies that I present in the next few slides. So one is the the, the scale at which nature-based solutions are applied. It's often a question that we do get and something that we are trying to work through. But the current thinking is that we think they should be applied at a landscape scale um, and that they should be, if possible, part of an overall design of policies uh, and measures or actions to address a specific challenge. Uh, with the power in that being that if a policy is adopted, there's a higher likelihood that more nature-based solutions to various societal challenges will be taken up and used on a wider scale. Uh, first, the first part of uh, the case studies will refer to urban areas. This is work being um, coordinated by my colleague Chantal Van Ham in uh, our Brussels office. Um, in, uh, in Europe, three quarters of Europeans live in urban areas and globally 60% of the urban infrastructure of the future still needs to be built. Beyond Europe, uh, the United Nations um, and a report on urbanization statistics shows that that urbanization is rapidly increasing in most countries around the world um, uh, in an astounding rate and so the nature-based solutions that we are seeing in Europe now are highly relevant to many parts uh, to many cities around the world. In Europe and many other places subnational governments play a decisive role in land planning and management and investment um, and this in part refers to principle eight where we're talking about the uptake of nature-based solutions into policies and so part of our work focuses on working with governments at the subnational level to promote uh, the integration of nature-based solutions into their work at a variety of levels. By 2013, approximately $10 trillion will be spent on repairing and expanding water infrastructure, for example. But we also know that nature-based solutions um, can perform some of, the, some, some of these same functions or can be implemented in an integrated manner. Um, this is something that uh, Hilda also referred to. So we're not replacing all solutions are not replacing everything, uh, but rather saying there is a place for ecosystems and the services uh, that they give that they give uh, to society. There is a place for that in the planning, um, uh, in urban planning, and elsewhere. If I use some examples, one is the eco asset strategy in Gibson's Canada. Uh, this is North America's first natural asset policy with a, an effort to value nature and bring it into the DNA of municipal. Uh, decision making. So the approach that they're taking there is that um, they identify existing natural assets uh, that provide municipal services. So said another way, they're identifying ecosystem services that are relevant to their uh, to their city and its inhabitants and they're measuring them and they're in integrating them into such an um, asset plan. As a contrast to this particular case study, we can consider what happens when this valuation of ecosystem services is not integrated. In uh, uh, the United States, um, 
just a few weeks ago, Hurricane Irma was uh, devastating Houston, Texas. And in that particular case, um, the, the flooding that was related to, to the hurricane uh, was in part a result of poor uh, valuation of ecosystem services. And over the past few decades, the policies around building on wetlands, um, they had just stopped protecting these wetlands. And so part of the devastation that we saw was in part, in part related to the lack of valuing of ecosystem services and the lack of having nature-based solutions in place to combat uh, disasters such as flooding. Another example coming this time from Colombia, also in the urban context, is the provision of, uh, of, of water to urban residents. So in the city of Bogota, um, 8 million residents depend on water emerging from the watersheds in two national parks. Uh, in order to protect this park, a trust fund has been created to attract uh, to fund, uh, funding meant to preserve, to preserve this ecosystem. Um, this is estimated that it will save as much as four million uh, per year by investing in such protection. And so in here we're seeing a nature-based solution to water security. In reference to green, uh, green roof uh, strategy of Hamburg in, in Germany, this uh, in relating to some of the comments that Hilda had made, here's, a, um, here's an example uh, where Hamburg is, intends to have 100 hectares of green roof surface in the metropolitan area within the next 10 years. It's supported by the Hamburg Ministry for Environment and Energy. And the goal, the reason that the city is interested in this is because it can lower maintenance costs uh, and lower energy costs and increase water retention. Uh, it will, um, uh, these, these green roofs, in fact, will be providing critical ecosystem services in many ways uh, to, to this city. And yet another example, one that I had the pleasure of visiting last year, is um, a community-led flood control in Medmary, the United Kingdom, in what's called um, managed realignment. Um, in, in the early 2000s, the community was very concerned about coastal flooding in their area, and they uh, they began uh, discussing with experts, including those from the Netherlands, on how they could uh, how they could reduce coastal flooding and erosion. And they um, they then began working with the UK Environment Agency, who adopted a, a very uh, comprehensive stakeholder approach uh, that had um, so there, were, there was regular feedback between stakeholders, residents, and the Environment Agency, as well as biodiversity groups. And in the end, they ended up. Uh, uh, we're knocking down their flood walls and creating wetland out of farmland uh, in order to reduce flooding. There was engagement with the private sector, both to the north and south of the project, which extended its impact. And currently today, this site is, measured, is managed by the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds. What's very interesting though, is that this is part of a, nat a nationwide strategy. It's not a one, a one site only. Um, application. Um, many countries in Northern Europe are adopting such strategy and so here we see the power of how nature-based solutions can be brought into national policy and have an impact um, at the landscape and local scales. And in a final example, the greening from the Sahel is, is another one that comes from the bottom up. In the Sahel, after many a period of drought, uh, rainfall has been increasing and since 2000, approximately 16% of the Sahel is re-greening. Um, rainfall is not thought to be uh, the only cause. There's been a lot of research on this topic. And one of the causes is thought to have been through farmers who have been reclaiming old techniques, which you can see up in the right, uh, upper right hand part of the screen, uh, where they are using a pruning technique which fosters tree growth. And in doing so, they are fostering tree growth on their, on their farms and in their pastures. Uh, which is then uh, through uh, many studies, it's demonstrated the, um, that this increases water retention in the soil, increases the productivity of their lands, and is having lively, quantifiable livelihood benefits. Uh, in Niger, over 20 years, 200 million trees were established over an area of 3,000 square kilometers, which you can see compared, compared on this slide below, between 1975 and 2005. It's a bottom-up process. It's not part of a formal policy shift, but we're seeing it in other countries as well, such as Burkina Faso and Ethiopia. So it's very interesting in terms of a case of nature-based solutions being achieved at a very large scale through individual actions. The book, where, uh, one book where you can find uh, more references on case studies is, is in the top. It's the one we published, the top link, and the one we published uh, last year. And if you have any questions, please do feel free to, to contact us. Thank you very much.